I just want to say welcome, Gary, and uh, welcome, Jason. Thank you for being here today. I am Lynn Mazzara. I am a navigator with the Mastrius program. I have been with them for about two years now. Um, I love this platform, and I love the mentorship platform, which is, adds a whole new level to working with an artist. And I'm really excited to introduce to you Jason Jenkins. And I'm just going to read a little bit um, of an introduction. Um, Jason Patrick Jenkins is a passionate and skilled artist committed to the School of Contemporary Classical Realism. Born and raised in Newfoundland, Canada, he has toured the world, observing and painting what he sees and feels. He began his studies with a four-year bachelor's in fine art from Memorial University of Newfoundland in 2001, and more recently added four more years of study in the advanced fine art program of the studio in Caminati in Philadelphia, where he currently holds a fellowship. In the interim, he studied glazing, a la prima painting, and the Dutch or Flemish method. He has worked with grids, projectors, and transfers utilizing photo references, but his preferred method is freehand, emphasizing gesture drawing and working in mass from the live model. His remarkable work, painted largely in oil, has been shown internationally. He currently holds associate living master status with the Art Renewal Center. His work and his method has been detailed extensively in Fine Art Today and International Artist Magazine. He has been recognized in multiple national and international juried contests. Um, I just want to add that Jason has been working as a full-time artist for over 20 years, and I am really looking forward to hearing about some of his experiences today. Um, welcome, Jason. Well, thanks, Lynn. That was quite the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, it's going to be fun having a chance to chat about some of this stuff. Um, yeah. It's been, thanks for having me. Thanks for hosting. Well, hello, Raven, and hello, Karen. Nice to see both of you. We, I just introduced Jason, and I'm so happy that you two are here to share this with us. Um, feel, You're welcome. I just want to let everyone know, feel free to leave your camera on or off. It's up to you. And please feel free to ask questions, um, to uh if you, you can interrupt or you can put them in the chat, you can type a question in the chat and I'll read it for you. Um, and you can, if you like, under the reactions tab, there is a raise your hand and you can do that if you would, don't want to interrupt, but you have a question to ask. Okay. Um, Jason, do you want to talk a little bit about yourself right now? Sure. Um, well, I can say that I consider myself to be pretty fortunate because I have always known in some capacity or another that this is the direction I wanted to go in. Um, born and raised in Newfoundland and can't remember a time when I wasn't in art. You know, maybe not quite so many opportunities where I come from, um, but that just eventually led to traveling. And, uh, Eventually, that traveling led me to uh, my current location here in Philadelphia, where um, I had the opportunity to study at Studio in Kaminati for four years, coming here all the way from South Korea, um, which was another whole adventure. <laughs> and, uh, you know, several years later, I guess it's almost 10 years this year from when I started studying at Kaminati. And I've been teaching there now. I'm actually on faculty now. And have been for a few years, so that's been, you know, pretty a pretty, pretty feel good experience. Come to study, and then shortly after, join the faculty. And uh, at this point, uh, things are looking pretty good. I, in this coming uh, fall semester, I'll be joining a second faculty at another local institution. So yeah, it's been it's been quite the journey, but it's been. <laughs> really exciting. <laughs> um, I read in your um, information on Mastrius that you, after 15 years, you decided to go back to school 
that must mm-hmm. have been, that must have been a big decision. Yeah, yeah, that was that was an odd moment in time. Um, so I, I graduated with my Bachelor of Fine Arts in 2001, and in 2013 I went back and started school again. So it was almost 15 years. I guess it was it was 12 years. Um, double check my math. <laughs> just in case um but yeah so in, in all that time what i found was um the deeper i dug to try to self-educate because you know i mean i so i got my my bachelor's but i discovered shortly after that there were other things i wanted to add to what i had already learned and so i became a little bit of a research fiend for, for you know, technical uh topics you know how did caravaggio produce that red or what have you. And I would, I would spend long hours on the internet digging through articles and blogs and different things. Get, yeah, it's kind of a nerdy period there for a while, but I'm kind of proud of it. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, you know, all that kind of thing was going on and I was getting more and more um, fascinated by the, the rabbit hole of technical procedure. And the deeper I dug, the more I realized there was holes in what I knew. Right. And as a needle in a haystack gets to be smaller or the haystack gets bigger, eventually it's like, okay, am I getting diminishing returns here? Do I have to go back to school and repay the foundation? So um, at that point, I had been in in South Korea for six years. And, uh, you know, I was was doing pretty good in South Korea with with regard to quality of life and professional practice and what have you. I was showing. but there came a point in time when I just realized I needed to come back to the Western Hemisphere, you know. Um, and so when that time came, I, of course, was thinking after six years, how am I going to reintroduce myself to the West? Do I just show up and see who remembers? <laughs> <You> <laughs> <laughs> and I decided that uh, going back to school, even, even if... I had big disagreements with the program, let's say in the end, and say it went badly. I'd be part of a network at least. I would have landed in a community and been able to, to begin to try to get my bearings within right. the art community. You know? um, and as it turned out, I mean, the education was life-changing. How? So, How was it life-changing? That's really exciting. Oh, God, yeah. It, it was exciting. <laughs> um, so... When I was a kid, I would freehand draw. And I recall many, many times when I was throwing notebooks in the garbage and cracking pencils in half and just frustrated because I couldn't get stuff to go the way I wanted. But what I found over time was the more I learned about different techniques, the more I was drifting away from that freehand drawing and more getting into uh, mechanical means. Um, And a large part of that wasn't just a reflection of knowing more. It was a reflection of trying to perform within a commercial system more. I wasn't six or seven years old anymore. And so the stuff I was finding was related to producing at higher volume, for instance. Right. But, um, you know, no, I got no issues on an ideological front with any of those methods, printing, uh, transfer, grids, what have you. I've done them all and I still do on occasion. Um, but what I found was as I was digging my way through there, um, I was, I was really developing a specialized, a very specialized approach. It was getting narrower and narrower. And when I came to Kamenati and studied what I, what I was really looking at in the end was if I knew one side of something, what they offered in curriculum was the opposite side of it. It was the total polar opposite to the approach I was currently working in. Do you have an example of what that would be for yeah. us? <laughs> yeah. So um, I had really kind of narrowed down in the years previous to the Dutch method, which I had to piece together from scraps on the internet. Um, but that is essentially a very slow layered process where the first couple of layers are done exclusively in transparent browns. Then there's a black and white layer, which you can restrict to the light and keep out of the shadows. But some people will do the entire painting in black and white. Um, if you, you know, if you keep it separate in the shadows, then you end up with warm shadows and cool lights right from the get go. It's also known as the moonlight layer. Okay. Um, and then you would begin start making, um, 
glazes of color, thin washes of color over top of that. Not necessarily exclusively glazes, but that's when you start playing with medium and bringing in different layers of color over top. Um, that was the way I was working for several years before I went to Incominati. And when I got to Incominati and there was no more transfers, there was no more slow layering, you could get in and start piling up paint a little bit faster. You could work a bit more intuitively, a bit less mechanically. So the transfers ceased. It was working from life exclusively, right? And um, what, what came with certain frustrations and difficulties in the beginning, because I was so used to transferring photos, became an absolute passion because you, know, you eventually begin to see yourself um, changing in the way you perceive, in the way you strategize. And as all that begins to accumulate, it goes from being a frustration, a frustrating equation to problem solving on some kind of puzzle, right? And, and then it gets really enjoyable. So four years of that, um, being pushed to advance from a five or six color limited earth palette to what is now in mine, I think about a 29 or 30 color palette in high <laughs> synthetic promos. Wow. And this is what you did at the studio in Caminati? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So they, they teach color based on Henry Henchy's method out of Provincetown, which was which was entirely based on uh, relative color relationships. You know, you, you can affect the entire key, the entire range of the painting based on how you interpret key and range. Right. So... Well, on the one hand, you, you can have four people looking at the same scene. One of them could turn it into a Mozart because it's all high keyed. Another one could turn it into a Wagner because it's all low keyed. Right? Somebody else could be playing a Beethoven in between. It's still a compressed range, but it's not particularly high or low. And then you could have somebody on the other end playing Vivaldi where they've got the entire thing stretched wide open. Right? And, and so you're getting four different types of atmosphere out of the same reference potentially. Right now, that was fascinating for me because I had been working from photos and doing transfers for all these years previous with that limited palette. And working from a photo with a limited palette means two things. Number one, I've already got a certain amount of information restriction coming in through the photo. Right, The camera is not adjusting in a moment. The camera is ballparking an entire moment, condensing it, increasing contrast, and giving me what it's considered to be the best read on that moment it can provide. Right. Whereas if I'm there from life and I can look around, I can adjust to different things. I can strategize, I can compare. And, and so that's going to give me a big advantage. And that's one of the reasons why, despite the fact I have no problem with any of these methodologies, I do encourage working from life, even if it's going to an open studio once a week or something, you know, to keep, kind of keep those um, other perceptible muscles up to speed, you know. Um, but so, I, we, yeah, we went from, that where you're really kind of forced to um, be as accurate to the photo as you can, right? You've already got limited means, so you can't really adapt. And you're working with a limited palette, which is giving you a limited range. You really got to kind of hug pretty close to the line. Right. Um, in, in, terms, in terms of making a, a good likeness, you can still turn the key up or down a little bit, but it's mostly going to be driven by value at this point, right? On the flip side with this other palette, I've got about a hundred miles more range, right? I could, I could, we could go from electric guitar to classical bass, depending on how how much we lean the chroma one way or the other, right? Let's look, let's let's look at it this way: if we've got the same relationship of notes in one painting, okay, we'll just I'm going to run back through this model real quick. So let's just say we've got a hundred range note, a okay. hundred note range. Sorry. And so we're looking at a relationship across that 100 note range that picks up on four values. It's going on four. Only <laughs> four, four values. Okay. So, okay, so we got four values in there. We're going to go with 130. No, let's go with, yeah, 130, 50, 90. Okay, that's our relationship. Now, if that's on the 100 note range, we've got a really, really broad range. We're going all the way from high to low. Right. Right, that's Vivaldi. Now, if I take that relationship of 130, 50, 90, I bring it all the way down to the deepest end. It's 1359 out of 100. Okay. That's Wagner. Right. 
we take it all the way up to the top. So it's 91, 93, 95, 99. It's Mozart. It's an area. We bring it down to 51, 53, 55, and 59. It's mid-range, right? And it's kind of compressed, kind of intimate. It's Beethoven. Which works right? for music, but can you translate that into artists? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's I don't, I, th I think the way I look at it, it's, it's more directly related to the image because, you know, one artist can produce many different atmospheres in their, in their works, right? Absolutely. Um, and you want to be able to exploit that depending on the nature of what you're trying to do, right? But I can take the music thing one step further. If we turn the chroma way up, we get electric. And if we turn the chroma down, we get more earthy. We've got classical. Okay. Um, that is <laughs> and that's a really interesting way to look at color. Um, and I could see how, um, yes, you're, you're getting the complete opposite of what you've been learning. Now, how do you bring those together in your own work? Like that must have been um, an exercise uh, w would have taken you a while to, to amalgamate it, it, all of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it definitely took a while. Um, so, so while I was at uh, the school as a student, I had to take most of what I already knew and put it aside. You know, my first, maybe my first year, year and a half, I was resistant and like, well, what about this? And what about that? And I wasn't getting as much out of it as I could have or should have. So I took all that stuff, I threw it in the shed. And um, for the next few years, I drank the Kool-Aid. Okay. And, um, you know, I, I got a lot out of it. But I also knew that when the time came and I graduated, I had to go back to the shed and release the hounds. Right. So I would say the next three to four years was kind of juggling these different elements and trying to figure out how to best fit them together in terms of in terms of number one, meeting my vision and in terms of number two, providing me with a technical process that I could weave together from the scraps of these different things and still have them all true to themselves. You know, and that, so like for, you know. That's what oh, I'm excited ahead. about is your technical process that you've woven together that we will now benefit from all of this that you've been through. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to share it. I mean, it, yeah, I look back at history. So, yeah, I, I um, when I was in my bachelor's, I took enough philosophy and art history classes to technically have a minor in both. But the bachelor's program did not for minors. So I don't have a minor in either. <laughs> but I look back at, uh, at the history of the whole thing, you know, and from the time I was a kid, I knew I knew I was drawn to classical art. Um, what I didn't realize until many years later is that some of the lack of opportunity that was out there was a result of it falling out of favor. Right. Uh -huh. And so for most of my lifetime, um, it's been, I mean, I, I do come from a very small place originally. But um, it's it's not been in in favor. You know, realism in particular is, is, has fallen out of currency. And I've been very fortunate because in the past 20, 30 years, there are institutions starting to grow that are pushing to support the regrowth of, of the realist movement. You know, there's plenty and plenty and plenty of population out there to support every branch. We don't need to be at each other's necks if we do different things. Um, but, you know, I, I figure feel fortunate to have, you know, experienced this period of time when these programs are coming around, these institutions are growing, the school, the educational range of options out there is growing. Um, and as somebody who didn't have all those opportunities in the beginning, but through a bunch of circuitous twists and turns in life that nobody anticipated, um, managed to get some of the education that I have, I feel like it's, you know, not, not just an honor, it's a duty, you know, to, to, try to share and disseminate for the health of this tradition. It wasn't that long ago. It was on the ropes. <laughs> you know? Well, so. um, I was really intrigued um, that there was a line on your website where you said, study with me in a method designed for all experience levels and backgrounds. And that really intrigued me. Um, could you speak to that a little bit? Is that possible? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so the method that I use to teach, which is which is primarily taken from the Incominati method, a few modifications here and there. Um, but the premise of it really 
takes you in a direction that's so counterintuitive to what most of us expect that it really in some ways eliminates a lot of the advantages of previous experience. Um, and at the same token, it's so systematic that not having experience sometimes makes it easier to take it on board because you don't have anything to conflict with it. Right. It's a very, very systematic, systematic process. And, you know, I mean, it recruits a lot of the same things that I'm sure everybody's heard before, big to small, abstract to specific. I don't assume we've heard yeah. any of this before. <laughs> okay, fair, fair enough, fair enough. Um, my, my only point being that there's a lot of phraseology that gets repeated in many overlapping circles of, of art education, but that oftentimes means something slightly different to each of them. And what I'd like to say without sounding too arrogant is that this particular method really kind of cuts away the things it's not saying and focuses on what it is saying and says something very clear that is A, B, C, D, E. You need to consider this first. You need to consider this second. Right? And it's not like, well, you need to consider everything about the eyeballs. You know, it's, it's more like, well, how big do you want the head to be? Make a mark for the top and the bottom. They're not going to change. So would you say that um, for your mentorship, it it could be for a student who is just starting out as well as a more advanced or experienced artist or um, is like, where would you, where, where would you think the, the, the artist would fall in your mentorship? Well, the mentorship has been designed for emerging artists. Um, but I think that's largely simply because of my own leaning toward a lot of technical talk a lot of you know technique and art history, um, and you know learning learning some of the business side of it from hard experience. You know, um, more matter of where some of that conversation may have gone. But when it comes to to studying and learning a particular method, I, I teach all skill levels and I teach them all the same way. So you know, if if somebody considered themselves perhaps beginner instead of emerging but they were interested in those conversations and seeing what they could get out of it, I would have no reason to turn them away. Wonderful. Um, I also wanted to ask you, where am I? Oh, first of all, does anybody here, welcome all the people that have come in in the last few minutes. Does anyone have any questions or anything that they want to ask Jason? Um, feel free to take, turn off, turn on your microphone and ask or um, type it in the chat, whatever you feel comfortable doing. And I know there was one question from Karen because she missed the beginning of the introduction and she was interested in, in hearing what you went back to school to take, where, where you went and what you, what you took. Hmm. So I was living in South Korea when I decided to go back to school and I went to the artrenewalcenter.org website. They have a list of what they consider a, a, a approved atelier programs approved by their own standard, you know, but they, they came up with a list of qualifications to put them above a particular rating or something. And so I went to that list of schools knowing that at least it was going to focus on the direction I wanted to move in, wouldn't have to be digging through quite so much. And there I found in Kaminati, amongst several other schools I applied for, um, for various reasons between not hearing back, getting waitlisted, et cetera, et cetera. And um, some visa considerations. I was married at the time. Um, it ended up landing on in Kamaladi for several reasons. And <clears throat> when I applied to Kamaladi, I really, coming from the opposite side of the playground, technically, I was really uncertain about how some, some of the techniques were going to work out for me. I'm really kind of hesitant on a few things. <laughs> But I thought, uh, you know, if, if, the, if I've been digging in the same places and there's still gaps in what I'm finding, then I need to go somewhere different, you know. Um, and at the end of the day, the, the intersection of those different schools of thought has become one of the most intriguing things about painting for me. Because there is so much that sounds a whole lot different that really isn't that different at all. And that's wow. what gets really fascinating. Wow. Um, 
Oh, I have a question here from Karen again. Um, does someone need to be able to draw in this method? Do you have to be able to do realism? Um, not necessarily. I mean, the first thing, the first thing that I actually teach in the classroom is abstraction. Because that's how we find the, the premise that we're going to build into realism. You know, a big shape arrangement, right? That um, is abstraction. Wait, wait, you're yeah. saying like we should know this. How would you <laughs> that oh, uh, on my yeah, mind no. start starting with abstraction <laughs> to teach realism seems to be something way out there. <laughs> All right, fair, fair enough. But let, let me let me put it this way. Um and I, I did mention that's counterintuitive earlier. So here's <laughs> here's where the rubber hits the road on that. Um, previous to Incominati, when I was doing a portrait, I would start in the corner of the eye and I would spiral out, building the eye, building the eye socket, expanding, expanding, expanding out to the perimeter of the face. Um, and at the end of that, I might find that I had two beautifully drawn eyes, but that one was a little bit too high. Right. And, and that's kind of been the struggle for, for years was to get better and better at that. So I had to make less of those grand adjustments where you're going to move a whole eye. Um, but in terms of how we approach drawing and whether or not you need drawing skills to be able to approach it, absolutely, you don't. It's, it's, it's the less you know in some way starting out, the better. Because what's going to happen is with this approach, it's, it's a matter of you look at the object that you're trying to draw, the person you're trying to draw, and you say, well, what is the big overall kind of shape is it a rectangle? Is it a triangle? And you're going to make that shape. And then you're going to adjust that shape until it really starts to resemble the shape that you see. Right? So if I had a figure with, um, let's see, I had a figure model with, with feet spaced out to shoulder width. Right? Essentially, if their hands are at their side, it's basically a long, tall triangle. Okay. Right? So without getting caught up in the angles of the shoulders or where the arms might break the perimeter of the figure or any of that stuff, just figuring out the width of the feet, the angle to the top of the head, the width of the feet, the angle to the top of the head and back down again and getting that width and that height sorted with those appropriate angles, you can begin to see a likeness for the figure in those three lines. Wow. Right. So it's not a matter of can you draw because what's usually the determining definition of whether or not one can draw is, is not just proportional stuff, but it's how much detail can you do. And detail in it, many ways is, is massively overrated. If you can't get the gesture, the proportion, the structure, the value range, the form, all that sorted out before you even think about detail, all it's going to do is undermine all these other things. And they're all higher priority. That makes so much more sense. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, totally. I mean, what do we hear our entire lives, right? Oh, it's so detailed and it, it everybody mm -hmm. means well, but it gives us this way of thinking where we're like counting every teeny tiny thing. Yep. Um, would it be okay for us to switch gears a little bit and for you to talk about something that's actually near and dear to my heart, which is um, what's cheating? Like, I have heard from different <laughs> artists like, oh, using a reference photo is cheating. Oh, using a projector to get your image on, on a piece of paper is cheating. Oh, um, using a grid method, it means that you really don't know how to draw. So are you really an artist? Debunk all that for me. <laughs> yeah, very, very simply in my mind. Um, if you are using any kind of creative means to take from a reference some information and produce a new thing, you're not cheating. That's what we do. That's what we've always done. Whether it was, you know, um, 30,000 years ago, drawing bulls on the side of a cave, it was looking, extrapolating, rendering. Awesome. Right? So whatever means you're using in that spectrum comes down to preference, taste, goals, priorities right i mean i i spent the past well not the past four years i'm getting i'm getting older i've been graduated now five years but i spent a four-year period not that long ago uh training rigorously to work exclusively from life but last year i finished a four-foot still life that started with a grid that's a simple matter of that still life had 
in the ballpark estimate, 80 to 120 objects in it. Mm -hmm. Freehand drawing it on a four foot canvas would have taken way too much time. I've got other things I need to do, like buy groceries and go to class and different things, right? So I, I had to look at time management. This was a commission already paid for, for somebody who, who I've been working with now for 20 years. I know what kind of work they do or don't like. And I also knew that uh, with the four years of working from life, I could remove any of the um, telltale signs of the grid or, or a photo or anything like that simply through the experience of having worked from life and knowing what the differences were, right? So at that point, the whole old adage, you can break the rules when you know them, comes full circle, mm -hmm. right? If you don't know how to walk those various technical paths, then you don't know how to weave them back together and make an alternative path. So is there any such thing as cheating? In my mind- no. I think, I personally think what, if you think it, do it, um, uh, you're an artist, anything goes, but. I'll put it this way. If I were to think of something that in artistic practice, I could call cheating. The only thing I can think of would be copyright violation anyways. And that would be taking somebody else's work and calling it your own. Right. And we all agree. Right? Like, we all agree on that. I mean, if otherwise, you know, what is, what is one of the most beautiful things about this whole tradition is that we all kind of feed this wellspring of creativity, right? And, and if we don't feed the wellspring and we end up isolated from it, we're not, we're not drawing inspiration from it. We're not learning and sharing part of that community and our work suffers, right? But generally speaking, we feed this, this vessel of energy sort of that flies through the culture, mm -hmm. right? And we're all part of it. And the more we feed it, the stronger it is. So, you yeah. know, you have, have, like I said, an over over 20 year career as an artist, and you have fed yourself and paid your bills doing this. <laughs> Is, <laughs> um, anything um, you can share with us? Like, did you did you have to um, change how you wanted to paint because of that or? Um, um, yeah, there was definitely some, some things that were taken into account along the way. Um, so first off, let me say that I didn't feed myself that entire time. Okay. <laughs> there was, there was a bankruptcy along the way. Um, just as there was six years teaching in South Korea along the way. Right. But whether it's one or the other as two extremes in between, you know, I worked in, a, in an office supply store, I worked in restaurants, I was a bartender, I was a bus boy, I was a, I was a server, mm -hmm. right? And so the first reality um, of, of being you know, able to support yourself for 20 plus years as an artist is you sometimes have to supplement, simple as that, right? And finding, finding the supplement that can work with you rather than undermine your practice is crucial, right? So for instance, when I went to South Korea, I was teaching for five hours in the evening at a private academy, which meant I had all day in my studio. It was brilliant. Oh, that does sound awful. That <laughs> sounds brilliant. It was, it was really incredible. Um, and then there's been other jobs that have interfered more, Right. Um, at this point, for instance, I bartend usually once or twice a week for a catering gig. It's for we uh, weekend weddings. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not usually any later than 11, maybe 12 at the outside. But years ago, I was I was waiting. I was, I was bartending, sorry, at downtown restaurant bars. I wouldn't get home until four in the morning. Right. The entire next day's work was a mess. Mm -hmm. Right. So one is a better fit than the other. And it's good to have a supplement like that, that can, that can really kind of support you because things come and go, right? They get lean sometimes and they get better other times. You know? Good. Yeah. 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 Just and passive income. That's the other one. And I'm, I'm new to that one, but passive income streams. Now, what would be considered a passive income stream? Like prints? Could very well be. Um, it depends on how you set it up. So like, for instance, there's a, a print on demand websites out there, mm -hmm. right? You're not, you're not ordering a ton of G-clays. You're not storing them. You're not trying to market them yourself. That would not be at all passive. That's another entire person's job, right? right. 
Um, but on the flip side, if if I were uploading images to say fineartamerica.com, mm-hmm. um, the print on demand machine, uh, I would open an account and, and their clientele would find me in a catalog with everybody else they carry. And if they were to order a piece, Fine Art America would print it, package it and ship it. And I'd get a cut. And that's, I love that idea. Like you said, you don't do anything but take really good photograph and upload it and open it again. That's it. Yeah. No, I mean, no, I should, I should say it takes a little bit more active marketing than that. You got to be like getting it out there. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, I mean, really there's not much else at all. And as far as getting out there is concerned, well, you know, you can always include a notice in the, in your monthly mailing list. Right. You can, you can put it up on um, your social media as once a month. Mm-hmm. It really doesn't take a massive commitment to promote something like that these days. No, right. social media has really changed the landscape of, for the artist, in my opinion. It really Absolutely. Uh-huh. Um, Gary, Gary has a copyright question. I don't know if this is anything that you could answer, but I will read it. What Mm -hmm. if I copy someone else's painting and give them credit on the back of the painting and then sell it? Mm. So when we copy someone else's painting, um, in academic circles, we're calling it a master copy. And that means that the title has to be after so-and-so, right? So if I were copying um, Van Gogh's irises, I would title it Iris is after Van Gogh. Okay. Right? And that's how you make it clear that it's a copy. Now, to give the other person credit and to sell it while it was still under copyright protection, that's going to generate some issues. <laughs> because first off, um, to reproduce it without changing it enough that you wouldn't give them credit is violation of his copyright. Yeah. Right. If you change, if you're going to reproduce it in 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 any format um, and not give him credit, it has to go under um, in, enough of a change to become something different. Mm-hmm. Right. It can be clear as day what the reference is, but the meaning is altered, or some significant visual portion of it's altered. It's recognizably different. Right. Um, and if you did that, you wouldn't want to give him credit because it's your it's your appropriated baby now. I think the the problem comes in, Gary, when you add the words and sell it. You can copy anybody's work for your own personal enjoyment and hang it in your home and or practice uh, is my understanding. Yes. But you can't sell it as your own work. I mean, the, the technicality of it is no one is going to say or do anything if you produce something and put it on your own wall, right? Technically, you need permission of the author to reproduce it but if you make a copy and it's it's you know it's a oh what's the word it's an homage right and it's for your personal use then no one is going to engage the machine of whatever to come after you right um but doing the same thing and turning over cash on it well then that becomes a question of royalties it becomes a question of precedent with other people who are potentially licensing or using that image and so it becomes a matter of necessity to kick up a stink, right? Just to protect future, potential future investments. That's right. And um, I have heard that in, the, in some countries, they have factories of artists who are copying other artists' work and putting it out there. Um, um, and artists are really losing out to like they don't get any credit for their own work they don't get any payment for their own work and it's being mass produced um yeah for everything yeah, from- it, it it really comes down to, to circumstances in a few of those different countries like I, I spent time in korea and my understanding was that the burnham convention didn't cover south korea because when i was there you could find knockoff version, knockoff versions of absolutely anything and everything. There was no copyright protection on, let's say, downloading films or anything like that. Mm-hmm. It was all facilitated to the highest end of luxury, right? I could, I could, when I was in Korea, I could set up eight movies to download, and by the time I entered the eighth one, the first one was finished already. It was <laughs> incredible. Um, but also, it means things like 
you know, I, there was there was a uh, convenience store curl called the um, GS25. And at one point, I looked at three corners of the intersection. I saw the GS25, the SG25, and the GS52. <laughs> right? And so, and so in, in those places, you know, without those protections, societal expectations are entirely different. Yes, they are. Right. Um, and I wonder, I wonder what it would be like to to talk to an artist who grew up in that situation and be like, so what's the deal? <laughs> tell me, tell me how this works for you. Yes. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it's outside of what I know. Um, I know that when an illustrator is hired to do work for hire, the copyright goes with the work, but they still get paid pretty good, hopefully, maybe. Yes. Um, but yeah, I guess it's different, different in different places. Different in different places. Um, does anyone have any questions or anything that they'd be interested in knowing uh, from Jason? You guys are really quiet. You're making me work here. <laughs> All right. Let's, I'm going to kill my headphones for a sec because I'm getting a warning that the battery's about to die. Okay. Okay. And Bear with me one sec. While you're doing that, I'm just going to share my screen. And I'm going to show you um, where you can find more information about Jason in the Masterius platform. This is masterius.com. And there is a, on the menu, it says mentorship. How it works is where you can start here to get more information about the Masterius platform. Choose your mentor. Um, when we click on choose your mentor, we get a list of different mentors um, that have upcoming um, sessions, but we're looking specifically for Jason. So I'm only going to type in his first name and Jason Jenkins appears. This is Jason's page. And for those of you that haven't seen it, this is some of Jason's art. Spectacular. And look at that. Oh, I particularly like this one personally um, and then a little bit about uh, the different specialties uh, that Jason will be offering in his mentorship and his mentorship he has one starting on July the 10th which is next week um, it, it will be the second Monday of every month you meet for two hours um, here are the different uh, time zones 6 p.m eastern time 4 p.m mountain time um, 8 a.m. in Australia. And in the mentorship, there are only um, up to eight members. So it's a small and intimate group. And Jason will really work with you um, to develop the direction um, that, that the group wants to go, um, uh, which is why it's different than a class, where a class is structured and has specific things that you're going to learn um, a mentorship is more personal and interactive. And um, as uh, Jason gets to know each of, of you as a member, he will tailor what he's sharing with you to um, what you're looking for and what you need. Um, and the other place you can go to find out about Jason is his website. And I have put links to both of these in the chat or in the, in the chat in our Zoom feed. Um, so again, uh, for more information, you can go there. Jason, did you awesome. want to speak to how you would see your mentorship progressing as far as you know, without having met your members yet? <laughs> oh, I mean, that really is the crux of the point though, isn't it? Um, as far as a mentorship is concerned, I really, I, I'm not seeing it as something where we walk in with a highly structured plan because we're going to have people coming in with different challenges and different struggles and different questions. So this is really going to be an ad adaptive in the moment kind of a situation. We're going to walk in, we're going to have a dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, I would ask um, anybody who's attending to maybe bring uh, two images with them, you know, to, to email those images in advance or however that unfortunately the platform works. <laughs> But, but to get two images to me, one that they considered highly successful and one that they thought presented 
a good example of a recurring challenge or a struggle, you know, and with that, um, you know, critiquing the one that's considered successful gives me a good idea of where your strengths and, and challenges may lie. And having one where you recognize one of your own challenges gives me a chance to really get in there from the get go and start giving you solid stuff to work with that you're going to see making a difference. You know, and then from there, that we have a growing dialogue, we get to know each other more, and the conversation begins to move on a weekly basis based on where that conversation is taking us rather than some predetermined path that may not actually, you know, resonate with anybody in the group. Right. And which is why I love this platform so much. I have grown by leaps and bounds as an artist, both in my business and in my practice, uh, because of the, the mentorship and how it works. Um, Gary has asked if you would be willing to show and discuss some of your work. Um, I could bring up that Mastery's page if you wanted to speak to some of those uh, images. Sure. Absolutely. All right, perfect. Just what I was hoping for. So the portrait on the far left and the figure on the far right. This one and this one. Mm -hmm. They were the result of a personal challenge I gave myself. So I was I was looking into you know this expanded palette for several years. This one I mentioned with 29 and 30 colors on it. After using it for five or six years, I decided it would be an interesting experiment to go back to a smaller palette. And so I gave myself the challenge of doing a couple of paintings with the Zorn palette, which is only four colors. That's right. Right. So the one, the figure on the far right, that was my first attempt, trying to maximize how much color I could get out of that four color palette. Wow. And thank you. <laughs> you know, it, came, it came out, I, I was pleased with it. I got, we got a fair amount of color out of it, but I did look at it at the end and say to myself, it's a little bit darker than I intended for it to be. And this, this is where some of the technical stuff I talk about comes into play. So I decided to do another one, but I decided to steal Rembrandt's underpainting technique as a foundation for it. And so that's the portrait on the other side. It's done with the exact same four color palette, but we've got a foundation of white underneath the flesh in the light. Oh, what a difference. Mm -hmm. It jacks up that range pretty significantly, doesn't it? It does. And so those, you know, I mean, those those were experiments. I really, I really do enjoy um, looking at the intersectionality, as we were saying earlier, between different schools of thought, right? In Caminati, uh, really taught me a fusion of the Florentine and the Venetian schools, and I already had Dutch methodology down beforehand. And there were several other artists, you know, along the way who I, who I paid really close attention to, who really specialized in glazing or in um, Latino painting. And so all of this, this cross-sectionality comes together um, at this point in a way where as different as Incominati's method may have seemed up front, it really did in the end provide the common thread that holds everything else together. I can relate all of these other things back to it as a foundation. And I can see how it as a foundation isn't necessarily what that foundation might have originally been, but has been advanced to become contemporaneously relevant, right? There are adaptations to methodologies that go back to the Renaissance that we teach at this school. And I'm not even sure if everybody is fully cognizant of just how related the history it is, but it's clear as day once you start digging why things have been modified the way they have to keep up with a higher range of color for starters. Mm -hmm. The underpaintings aren't treated necessarily the way that they used to be typically, because the way they used to be typically, as is shown here with that Zorn palette, can work really, really well to support a very narrow range of color. The question becomes, how do we find a way to integrate it with a more expansive range of color and not have it overwhelmed by the power of the synthetic color in the first place? Because if that happens, there's no point in bringing it forward. Which leads me to ask about this beautiful colorful piece with the dog <laughs> and the young girl i mean that, that this is where this is a vivaldi right <laughs> uh yeah we say that one falls on the lines of a vivaldi we've got a, we've got extensive value and chroma range mm -hmm. um, 
And that one actually turned out to be a lot of fun. Um, a friend of mine from 20 years previous and I got to talking about doing a portrait of her daughter. And I ended up digging through her social media accounts and scrapping together different pieces of different photos. So believe it or not, the dog comes from one photo. The little girl with the exception of the top third of her head comes from a different photo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> another photo. The arm with the butterfly is a different photo and the butterfly is yet another photo. And the background is completely invented. So this one was a lot of fun because it we kind of marked the turning point between all those years of academic studies at Incaminati and finally being able to say, okay, what can I actually do with this? Right. right? Right, but pull something together that isn't even there. Uh, where does where does academic work slip over the line into being useful for imaginative work? Well, I personally I call this a win on every level, um, Thank you. and I love color, so I can see why I'm drawn to that one in particular. But all your work um, is is just magnificent. Um, I can't see the chat. I'm going to stop sharing. So if anyone had any other questions, no. Um, Gary, was that what you were looking for? Is Hopefully that uh, spoke to what you were interested in seeing. Um, we are just about out of time. Um, is there anything that we have not addressed? for anybody. Would anyone like to take their microphone off and speak a little bit? <laughs> bring it on. That's a down. big no. Okay. <laughs> Jason, is there, are there any last words that you would want to share with us from your? Well, yeah. You know, I mean, it's been fun just chatting. Mm -hmm. we, we work on that, that coffee table experience which, which i really did because i like it being a bit casual um but with with some of the meandering and, and some of the, the fun that we got into i just maybe i should just run back over my thoughts on cheating and um selling out absolutely um so so in my mind it's as simple as this um as an artist you want to be like batman with these utility bells and when Robin goes, holy sharks, Batman, you want to have the bat shark repellent, <laughs> which means that you leave no tool un, unexposed, no stone unturned, right? And so as much as I do believe you kind of have to have a central philosophy to pin everything else to, um, I think it's, it's great to go beyond that one methodology that you really kind of got invested in first, right? It's It's just to bring in more options. And in my own experience, that ranges from every kind of transfer I can imagine to grids, to projectors, to freehand drawing, to, to pouncing, to cartoons, to anything and everything. And at one point, I got lost in this little spiral of trying to determine which of those was the superior path. You know, like trying to get you know, some kind of validation of being a purist or something. And at this point, I realized the most validation comes from being the master of all of it to the best of my ability and using it to solve the problems that would prevent me from producing the things I wouldn't otherwise produce because that's where my limits are. Um, Karen asks a really interesting question. Uh, what are your thoughts on AI generated images? Ooh. Oh, I know that's a, can <laughs> that's a whole new me meet the mentor subject. <laughs> topic. Um, <laughs> Well, I'll put it this way. My my initial thoughts on it um, are flashbacks to the movie Terminator 2. And I get a little bit, I don't know. But I will have to say, um, I've got I've got a one-on-one -on -one student I meet with once a week. And he was trying to figure out some compositional problems on a uh, piece he's working on. And he went into, what's it, chat GPT? Yeah. And typed in what he was looking for and it actually gave him um, a AI generated image that solved the compositional problem I mean he took that idea and kind of fixed up his painting since wow. so another tool yeah I mean at the end of the day here's what I have to say I'm biased because of Terminator 
But I also think that um, when photography was first invented and they said the camera was stealing people's souls, that was probably pretty much an equivalent of what all of the people like me were going, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> yes, um, yes. It is a whole new world again. Thank you, Karen, <laughs> for introducing that in our last five minutes. I hope uh, that spoke to you. Um, what about selling out? Yeah, I was just going to say, and to, to run back over selling out again, um, my notion on selling out is as simple as this. Um, you don't want to give up your integrity to produce something that you loathe every day. That would be selling out. You know, if somebody came to this morning and said, well, if you paint a spoon every day from now until the kingdom come, you'll be able to support your family happily and comfortably, but you can't do anything else because you're full-time doing that. No. No. <laughs> I yeah. know max of a month and then start to get a little stir crazy. Um, but that doesn't mean that you have to hold so tightly to every single aspect of your initial concept that you have no flexibility. You're not taking your, your viewers into account, right? Um, whether it's challenging material, the size of the wall space, price, um, what have you, you can flex some variables that are lower priority in order to enable yourself to be able to make a living at this thing. Because no matter what anybody says or does, at the end of the day, the worst form of censorship is running out of materials to produce your work and not being able to afford to get more. Right, that, that comes from, that's actually from the first uh, which Gary guy that I worked with, that's what he told me, and it really stuck, it resonated. It's like, you know what, I really do have to find a way to be able to afford to keep going in materials at the absolute minimum. Right? But more importantly than that, why shouldn't it be just as long as the profession of being a doctor or being a lawyer? Right? We have to study things that for uh, many walks of life may be a little bit uh, obs very obscure, a little bit off the beaten path, right? Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm rambling a little bit, I suppose. <laughs> Well, again, I want to thank you and everybody who joined us today. It's been a wonderful, informative hour. Um, I learned so much. And um, again, if you're interested in Jason's sessions, go to masteries.com, look up Jason Jenkins and all the information about his next uh, uh, sessions that are starting next week is there. Um, that's thank it. You. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, everybody. Hope you all have a great night.